Long ago and far away, in a little kingdom by the sea, a magnificent comet in the east prophesied the birth of an extraordinary prince who would dare to wage war against the mightiest empire. He was lightning marked for greatness as a little child in his cradle. Opponents in the castle poisoned his father, the king, when he was still a little lad. The queen, his own mother, sought to get rid of the prince. But he managed to get away and spent seven years living like Robin Hood in the wilderness. He developed his courage, strength, and knowledge of the properties of poisons and their treatments. The prince assassinated the evil queen when he returned to his realm. He rose to become a revered king who ruled over several countries. When the powerful empire across the sea invaded his realm, people from many lands joined his grand war. The battles against the empire lasted his whole lifetime. Many beautiful queens sat by his side, but the king found true love with a woman as valiant in battle as he. When the king died, his passing was echoed by a terrible earthquake. For thousands of years afterward, the great king's legendary deeds were remembered and retold. It appears to be a fairy tale, but include the historical facts as well. The First Mithridatic War was the first of three conflicts between Mithridates VI of Pontus and the Roman Republic that would continue for over 30 years. The closeness of the ambitious expansionist Mithridates to the Roman province of Asia, which had been founded after Attalus III of Pergamum died without an heir in 133 BC and left his kingdom to the Roman people, was the cause of the conflicts, which were unavoidable. Along with the province of Cilicia on the southern coast, this provided the Romans a foothold at the western extremity of Asia Minor. On the southern Black Sea coasts, in Asia Minor's northeastern corner, was the kingdom of Pontus. The kingdom had spread north under Mithridates, occupying Colchis and the Crimea on the Black Sea's eastern side, as well as a few smatterings of territory on the western shore. The region between Pontus and the Roman province served as Mithridates' upcoming objectives. In addition to Paphlagonia and Bithynia in the west, he was particularly interested in Cappadocia to the south. In 108 BC, he made his first move by invading Paphlagonia alongside Nicomedes III of Bithynia. The two rulers divided the nation and disregarded a request to leave made by a Roman envoy. The next action was taken by Nicomedes, who invaded Cappadocia in 102 BC. Laodice, the sister of Mithridates, governed this kingdom at the time on behalf of her two young sons. Laodice and Nicomedes were married after the invasion. In response, Mithridates launched a massive invasion and reinstated his nephew as Ariarathes the seventh Philometer. This agreement barely lasted a year until Mithridates switched sides in favor of Gordius, the Cappadocian lord who had killed Ariarathes the sixth, turning against his nephew. Both sides built up sizable forces, but the young monarch was killed during a negotiation before the combat. Mithridates appointed one of his sons to the throne as King Ariarathes IX, with Gordius as his regent. This administration was in place for four or five years. Both Cappadocia claimants carried their cases to Rome. Mithridates claimed that his son was the son of Ariarathes V, whereas Nicomedes backed Laodice's second son's claims. When the Cappadocians revolted against Mithridates' government in around 97 BC, they summoned Nicomedes and his pretender. Mithridates invaded and restored his son's government, killing Nicomedes' claimant in the process. Nicomedes retaliated by creating a phony third son. This boy and his mother were transported to Rome in an attempt to gain the Senate's favor. In response, the Senate ordered Nicomedes and Mithridates to leave Paphlagonia and Cappadocia. Ariobarzanes, the Cappadocian's new monarch, was put in power by Lucius Sulla, the Roman governor of Cilicia. This arrangement was just temporary. Tigrans the Great became king of Armenia in 96 or 95 BC and quickly aligned himself with Mithridates, marrying his daughter Cleopatra. Nicomedes died in 94 BC, 
leaving his empire to his son Nicomedes IV. Mithridates had acquired a powerful friend and lost a formidable adversary, and Rome seemed to be totally occupied in Italy with the commencement of the Social War in 91 BC. Tigrans invaded Cappadocia in 91 BC, exiling Ariobarzanes, who escaped to Rome. Mithridates attempted to assassinate Nicomedes, and when this failed successfully invaded Bithynia. Despite the situation in Italy, the Senate decided that both deposed kings should be restored, and sent a commission under Manius Aquilius and Manlius Maltinus or Mancinus to carry out their instructions. Once again Mithridates retreated in the face of Roman pressure, but this time the Romans went too far. Ariobarzanes and Nicomedes were ordered to mount plundering raids on Pontus. Ariobarzanes, already a hardened survivor of regional geopolitics, excused himself from the enterprise, probably informing his Roman sponsors that there were easier ways to commit suicide. Nicomedes had no such option. Nicomedes had offered to pay a large amount of money in return for his restoration, and Aquilius convinced him to find it by invading Pontus. Accordingly, late in 90 BC, Bithynian forces made an armed incursion into Pontus, plundering maritime Paphlagonia almost as far as Amisus. Though the Pontic army was more than capable of wiping out the invaders, Mithridates held back whilst he tried to establish exactly what was happening. Mithridates responded to this provocation by sending an envoy, Pelopidas, to the Roman commissioners, asked that they either restrain Nicomedes or allow him to fight back. Unsurprisingly the Romans refused these terms. Mithridates responded by invading Cappadocia, and then sent Pelopidas to the Romans for a second time. This time the envoy was arrested, and sent back to Mithridates with a message that he should withdraw from Cappadocia and not oppose Nicomedes. This was the last straw, and Mithridates now prepared to invade Bithynia. Aquilius ordered Nicomedes IV to lead his army into Pontus, ravaging the countryside as they advanced. They were unaware that Mithridates could call on an overwhelming force, far beyond what the Romans could have anticipated. According to Appian, Mithridates commanded 250,000 soldiers and 50,000 cavalry, including all the reserves and commitments that Mithridates could count on from allies around the Black Sea and Armenia. According to Memnon, Mithridates had 190,000 infantry, and 10,000 cavalry. Mithridates, in his mid-forties, had little combat experience. For this first crucial battle of his career, Appian says that Mithridates personally took charge of the troops massed at Sinope, placing Dorolaus at the head of the Greek phalanx. The fabulous wealth of Pontus was on display in the ranks of hoplites with beautifully wrought bronze helmets and breastplates, gilded spears, and shields flashing with jewels. There were bowmen, slingers, and peltasts, noble Persian Cappadocian knights, and Scythian and Sarmatian archers mounted on tough steppe ponies adorned with golden trappings. His ally Tigrons had contributed 10,000 Armenian cavalry riding large Parthian steeds. Mithridates' 300 warships and 100 pirate biremes displayed magnificent prows and luxurious decor. No expense was spared, the pageantry impressed his own soldiers and sailors as well as the populace, and it intimidated the enemy. As supreme commander, Mithridates took a strong hand in planning strategy. He found a vantage point from which to direct the action and dispatch more troops as needed. Among his experienced field generals were the brothers Archelaus, who had skirmished with Sulla and other brother was Neoptolemus, who had helped subdue Scythia. In a rare gesture of trust, Mithridates appointed his son Arcathius, a young man of twenty, to lead the prized Armenian cavalry. Hellenistic kings were usually loath to allow blood relatives to command forces that could be turned against them. Historians ask, why would Mithridates, whose paranoia was notorious, give this important command to his son? I think the answer lies in Mithridates' admiration for Alexander. 
Philip of Macedon had famously placed his 18-year-old son Alexander in charge of the cavalry at the important Battle of Chaeronea in 338 BC. Alexander's audacious maneuvers had turned out to be the key to Philip's great victory. Now in 89 BC, while Mithridates assumed the commanding role of a Xerxes or Darius the master strategist, observing the battle from a high vantage point, he cast his son in the role of young Alexander. Appian reckons that the Romans mustered 120,000 men between them. Cassius put himself on the border of Bithynia and Galatia, whilst Aquilius moved into the most dangerous position, ready to intercept and defeat Mithridates along his line of march if, as expected, he took the initiative and invaded Bithynia. Appius meanwhile was in Cappadocia positioning himself for an attack on the Pontic underbelly, perhaps considering a strike up the valley of the Iris at the Pontic capital of Amasia. Nicomedes was aiming for the same destination as Appius, but by a different route. He had taken 50,000 foot and 6,000 cavalry, and was making his way up the valley of the river Amnias, through the highlands of Paphlagonia. From there, once over the Halles, a good road led through the fertile olive groves of the Pontic heartland, past Lake Styphane, and then there was a gentle descent to the Iris River Valley. Here, all going well, Nicomedes would unite with Appius, and the pair would swoop on Amasia and claim victory. Such, at least, seems to have been the plan. As Wellington was later to observe, it is a rare plan that survives contact with the enemy, and Mithridates was following a different agenda entirely. I count myself fortunate to stand here. To stand here with my warrior brothers. To stand here for our people. I would not wish to be anywhere else this day. For, if the gods will it, we shall break this enemy and put them all to the sword. When news reached the Pontic camp that Nicomedes was on the move, Arcathias was sent to determine whether this was a full-scale invasion or a feint. At the Amnias River, Mithridates' generals brought out only a small force, 40,000 light infantry and Arcathias's 10,000 Armenian cavalry, greatly outnumbered by the Bithynian Roman coalition. But hidden behind the ranks of men and horses, a deadly surprise awaited the invaders, Mithridates' 130 war chariots equipped with whirling scythes. Such a place was the wide flat plain bordering the river Amnias, into which Nicomedes obligingly led his army, confident that his greatly superior numbers and more heavily armored infantry would force the enemy to give ground. To avoid that very eventuality, the Pontic generals sent a force ahead to seize a rocky outcrop between the two armies which would make an excellent defensive bastion. Nicomedes anticipated the move and deployed his own forces so rapidly that the Pontic advance force was in danger of being enveloped. Neoptolemus advanced to their rescue, yelling for Arcathius to bring up his cavalry. Arcathius's Armenian horsemen charged into Nicomedes' phalanx, a risky decision that could have resulted in heavy casualties. The move seems to mimic young Alexander's feat at Chaeronea. Was he attempting to replicate Alexander's coup, using cavalry as a shock weapon to charge head-on instead of harassing the enemy's flanks? The tactic worked, Arcathius's cavalry charge bought more time for Neoptolemus's phalanx to engage the startled enemy. Meanwhile, Archelaus and his highly mobile light infantry scooted around the edge of the enemy army to distract them with a flank attack should the need arise, as it probably would, given the greater strength and numbers of the Bithynians. After some time Neoptolemus's men were falling back under the pressure of Bithynian center. Archelaus rushed to his brother's rescue, leading a wedge of soldiers in from the right, forcing the Bithynians to turn and fight off the fresh troops. Cleverly, Archelaus yielded ground to them little by little, drawing the Bithynians away from his brother's men, giving them the chance to rally. Meanwhile Arcathius chased the enemy cavalry off the field, and established Pontic cavalry superiority. 
Then Arcathius looped back to try to get behind the enemy lines, which were in some disarray after fighting on two different fronts. It was time for the scythe chariots. Nicomede's Bithynian phalanx was now bunched up, the men standing back to back, straining to defend themselves on two fronts of the brother general's assaults. Peering through the dust swirling over the fight, Craterus, Mithridate's chariot master, grinned. The beleaguered phalanx presented his ideal target. Receiving the gleeful signal from his commander-in-chief, Craterus unleashed his chariots. The drivers whipped their powerful horses into a full-speed gallop. Suddenly 130 war chariots surged out and bore down like guided missiles on Nicomede's men. The vicious blades, spinning at a velocity three times the speed of the wheels, churned through the densely packed enemy. The shock was overwhelming, the carnage terrible. At the time of this battle, the natural philosopher Lucretius was a boy in Italy. Lucretius later wrote a hair-raising description of a scythe chariot attack. His introductory phrase, they say, suggests that this scene was based on the memories of survivors or witnesses. They say the scythe chariots, ravenous for slaughter, sheared off limbs so suddenly that legs and arms fell writhing on the ground before a man even felt any pain. In the ardor of battle, one soldier continued to fight, not realizing that his left arm and shield had been carried off in the wheel. Meanwhile his companion attempted to rise on one leg, while his other lay twitching its toes in a pool of blood. Also Appian state, chariots were driven at high speed into the Bithynian ranks. Some men were sliced in two within an eye blink, others were practically shredded. The army of Nicomede saw men in two halves, yet still alive and breathing, others sliced to pieces, their mangled organs still hanging from the sides. They had by no means lost the battle, yet the sight was so hideous that they were overcome with confusion, and fear disordered their ranks. The Pontic troops pressed their advantage. Archelaus and Neoptolemus returned to the attack, each from a different angle. This was disconcerting enough for the Bithynian phalangites, since the entire principle of the phalanx was that the entire army should fight pointing in the same direction. But the problem became immeasurably worse when Arcathius turned up again and hit them in the rear with his cavalry. Though now at a disadvantage, the Bithynians fought on grimly. Yet in the back of their minds there must have been the knowledge that if this was only the advance guard of the Pontic army, the Bithynians were surely doomed once the main Pontic force turned up, as it might do at any minute. Eventually, with Bithynian soldiers dying in large numbers, and the battle turning steadily in favor of Pontus. Finally Nicomedes decided that it was time to cut his losses, leave his army to its fate, and get himself off the plain whilst he still had the chance. The departure of their king was the signal for the Bithynian army to call it a day. Fighting to the death was not a local tradition, and dying for one's king became less appealing when that same king was a rapidly diminishing dot heading for safety on the horizon. For Pontus this was a highly rewarding battle in every sense. It was certainly won through the skill of the commanders who had used the mobility of their troops to maximum advantage, and had played the trump card of the scythe chariots at the best possible moment. Yet this would not have been possible without the discipline of soldiers who could maneuver quickly in discrete units, and retain their formation in the face of enemies who were more numerous and better equipped. Almost certainly, the experience gained in fighting Scythians was now paying dividends, this was the performance of a veteran army, confident in its ability and that of its commanders, even against uncomfortable odds. Not only was Pontic morale greatly boosted, since a major enemy army had been knocked out without even engaging the main Pontic force, but Pontic coffers received a commensurate boost, as Nicomede's camp was captured and his war chest along with it. Mithridates made the most of the propaganda value of his victory, explaining to the remnants of the Bithynian army now in his power that his quarrel was with Rome rather than themselves. 
He not only allowed anyone who wanted to go home to do so, but even gave each funds and provisions for the journey. But not everyone would have wanted to go home. The loyalty of Nicomedes' mercenaries was to Nicomedes' pay chest, and if that was under Pontic control, then so were the mercenaries. Consequently, it is probable that the manpower of the Pontic forces actually increased despite the casualties incurred in the battle. First Battle of First Mithridatic War was owned decisively by Pontus but the war was just started.